You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Architect Podcast, episode 81. I'm your host, Chris Webster, with my co-host, Paul Zimmerman. Today we talk, well, about a bunch of things. So grab your computer and let's get to it. All right, welcome to the show, everyone. Welcome, Paul. How you doing? I'm doing all right, Chris. How you doing? Nice. Good, good. Hey, as we're recording this, it's like, it's like mid-May, I think, and uh, but I think this episode's going out sometime around the time where I'm going to be kind of in your neck of the woods, but for a uh, for a wedding, actually. I'm going to be in upstate New York for, a, I don't know, some wedding. It's going to be all chaos for like four days, and then I come back nice, home. Nice, we're about. <laughs> uh, actually, my wife's family owns, um, owns a resort called Trout Lake Club up on Trout Lake near Lake George, apparently. Oh, that's so, great. Yeah, yeah. a few hours yeah. north of me. Yeah, one of the cousins who has lived up there her whole life, um, uh, or his life, I guess, um, he's getting married up there, and they they close down the whole resort, so the family's coming in, and we get the cabins and stuff like that, and it should be fun because I've never been able to to visit it, so it'll be a big good time. It'll be a a tech free vacation too, from what it's from the sounds of it. They still don't have like really solid cell service unless you row a boat out to the middle of the lake. <laughs> yeah, well, trying to enjoy that. I mean, sometimes it's nice. Not I long, know, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, but this uh, this podcast is anything but tech free, um, which is a good thing. So, you know, we don't have, as I mentioned in the introduction, a uh, a single topic for today's show because sometimes, you know, we we have things that build up and ideas that might not be entire shows, and and we just want to, you know, spend a little bit of time about them, uh, talking about them, and um, and go from there. So. I'll kick it off uh, because I read an article, and I'll link to this article in the show notes, so I'm not going to talk about it there. If you want to see it, go go check it out there. But I read an article about um, AR glasses and augmented reality glasses, and you know, you might remember Google's first foray into that with the Google Glass and the people that wore them, uh, affectionately known as uh, glass mm-hmm. holes. And I think, yeah, I think, I think that was just because we weren't ready for it yet. You know, the Internet of Things and all that stuff was coming around a little too quickly, and we weren't ready for the concept of somebody wearing glasses that may have had a camera that was, you know, looking at us or something. Constantly forgetting that we're always on surveillance video at some point, no matter where we go. Um, but either way, having somebody be able to directly look at you and possibly get information about you, although the glasses weren't that sophisticated. Um, You know, they could record video, sure. But I mean, how many videos do you think we're all on when we go to tourist sites and people are just walking around with their, you know, recording? I mean, I was... We were walking around downtown Reno just the other day, and they had this big car show thing going on. And we're just walking down, and there's all these, you know, great cars. And I saw more than a few people walking with either iPads or smartphones, just recording the cars. You know, and they're just like walking, recording, not making any, not doing any commentary. I don't know who's going to watch that, but just filming as they were walking along. Just filming as they're walking along and not asking me, and I didn't take offense to it, and nobody would have taken offense to it. But if I'd had glasses on that had a little green light in the center, then there would have been, you know, probably some people that were uncomfortable with that for some reason. Maybe it's because... I don't know. I I do think that um, with the whole Google Glass thing, part of that was that uh, the way that they announced it and that they pushed it and such, it was Mm -hmm. really very, (laughs) you know, filled with hubris and filled with... um, yeah. The, the the kind of Silicon Valley, we can do it, therefore we should do it without thinking about it. And this actually, you know, we yeah. had a recent episode talking about uh, digital ethics. And this is something that pops up frequently with regards to a lot of tech in uh, it, that comes out of Silicon Valley is, um, yeah, we can do it, but should we do it? Uh, you know, and so that that mm-hmm. question hadn't been answered yet with, with when Google Glass was announced. Um, I think everybody kind of right. knows and expects that sooner or later things are going in that direction. Hell, I mean, 30 years ago, I used to read uh, William Gibson books, right, where everybody's got like uh, video implants in their eyes and things. So, you know, it's it's not a new idea. It's been around. It's been percolating for a while, but it, it hasn't been properly digested by uh, by by pop culture, by the body politic, by our laws, by mm-hmm. all of the above. Um, this is off topic completely, but um, and I wish I could. Um, I wish I, I was looking for this before uh, a tweet that I saw a couple days ago, and I thought that it was Sean Graham, but um, I couldn't find it in mm-hmm. his thread. And uh, maybe it was Andrew Reinhardt, but I couldn't find it in his thread. <laughs> so I, I, I was, <laughs> you know, jumping around through a number of different digital humanities and archaeology kinds of people, and uh, and I couldn't find it again. But it was about. Um, 
a new technology being developed that can move one person's facial expressions onto a video of another person. Nice. I think I heard something about that as well. Yeah, it's yeah. a little. I'm, a, it's extremely cool, and B, it's extremely creepy at the same time. And um, oh yeah, I, actually, you know, creepy. Here, another thing. Um, a good friend of mine who used to work in my department for years um, quit her job last year here at the school to go back to study uh, for an MA at uh, or an MS. I'm not sure which it is actually. Uh, her master's degree at uh, at NYU in their ITP. It's uh, Internet Technologies Program, mm-hmm. Interactive Technologies Program. Anyhow, uh, so they had their uh, their exhibit, and they had all sorts of interesting, cool, different art exhibits, tech displays, pedagogical materials, all sorts of stuff, different student projects. But one of them, you go and stand in front of a great big screen with a video feed uh, of the floor there, and if you stand for a moment, it just erases you out of the video. <laughs> I mean, it's like you're standing next to Stalin because <laughs> you're yeah. just gone from the field. Yeah. So anyhow, but, but this is back to the the, the uh, video on glasses. Is yeah, you know, it mm-hmm. it's been tried. Um, and it will come, and we all know that it will come, and it'll have great uses, especially in certain vertical apps. Um, but I'm, you know, we'll see how people process yeah. it because the first attempt, Google's attempt, really kind of felt kind of flat. Well, yeah, and the the article I read led to a few other articles that I looked at regarding um, regarding augmented reality glasses, and this time it, it deals with Apple and uh, and and Johnny Ive was quoted uh, as saying, and Johnny Ive is the you know one of the like the lead designer at Apple for the last, I don't know, 30 years or something like that. A long time. You know, a lot of the big advances and designs in, in Apple products have come from, you know, his department or his head. I don't know how that works, but <laughs> anyway, yeah, he was quoted as saying the Apple watch itself w- was not designed, was not conceived of by Apple to really solve an existing problem. It wasn't designed to uh, solve something out there, which is what a lot of people do, especially entrepreneurs. They look for a problem and they say, okay, I have the solution to solve that. Let's create a business around this. He was actually quoted as saying that it wasn't designed to do that. It was designed to be kind of a familiar stepping stone to greater things, you know? So you put this thing on your wrist and now you've got this sort of interactive technology. I mean, sure, we've always had our phone. Well, we've had it for you know a while. Um, we've had our phones, but our phones have to be pulled out in our pocket. The watch is the first thing that we've, uh, and not just the Apple Watch, but all smartwatches, is the first thing that we've really you know, embraced as, as humanity, just like we did cell phones, because they're actually everywhere. Even if you're wearing a Fitbit, you know, Apple Watch, a Google, uh, the Google watches, the Samsung watches, whatever the case may be, we've all embraced those. Just about everybody has one on if they're wearing a watch at all. And that kind of adoption of that sort of technology on your wrist, interacting with your body, maybe taking your, I mean, mine is constantly taking my, my heartbeat and, uh, you know, future versions will do other things. And he said, that's a stepping stone. And they're saying, well, what's that a stepping stone to? Mm -hmm. And industry experts state that, you know, Apple is well on its way to having, um, you know, some people right now, their next smartphone could actually be a set of glasses around 2020 or 2021. That's only two or three years away. And, you know, a set of glasses that you would basically wear all the time that you want to be connected. Um, I'm not sure. I would imagine that they still probably have to be connected to a phone, but maybe not. The Watch Series 3, the one I'm wearing now, has its own data plan, is connected to a cell network, and is incredibly small. And if you could move all these components around, you could easily put them into the frame of a pair of glasses and then stick a camera in the um, in the lens if you got to do that, um, because it needs the camera to interact with the environment, not necessarily to record people like we mentioned earlier, but to scan its surroundings and interact with the environment. So... It, the applications for our for you know society are 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 ridiculous. Um, I mean, just looking looking at what you could do with that, I and mean, you see all the movies and stuff where oh somebody's Facebook profile or whatever shows up. Sure, that's all the creepy stuff, but the applications to archaeology are phenomenal. I mean, so many things that we do rely on data that we collected in preparation for a project, or data that's being collected while you're actually doing the project, and the ability to see those data in place and maybe overlaid on your surroundings and, uh, and maybe even to, you know, quickly scan something in your hand and shoot that over via the network to somebody else's glasses. And now they can see it, you know, they can manipulate it in their space and they can tell you exactly what that is or something like that. I mean, the ability to, to interact and, and, and just 
layer all this stuff on top of your environment, let alone like historic maps. You know, I, I don't know how many times I've had to record historic roads and we've got a, you know, you've, you had to geo reference a historic map. This is the best way to do it. Geo reference a historic map, mm-hmm. put it on some sort of like PDF of Enza maps. We've talked about that. Um, Venza PDF map, sorry. And then I, I'll actually be like driving on the, historic road with my tablet or phone sitting on the dash trying to figure out where this thing is well imagine just being able to see it through your glasses and and just drive on it and just see the map and see the historic road and then take that a step farther and see the historic surroundings if we have that kind of data or we can start producing those kind of data we talk about our jobs as archaeologists you know as as subsurface non-destructive subsurface technology starts becoming more and more prevalent not just gpr and things like that but you know our actual digging and things like that is going to start becoming less and less and less so finding other ways to you know, put ourselves out there as archaeologists and, and maybe creating these worlds for people to live in from an augmented reality standpoint is, is one way we could go in the next 20 years. Who knows? But I'm pretty encouraged by it and I'm looking forward to it. And I will sign up for a pair of the minute they're on pre-order. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always, uh, I'm always uh, one that hangs back a little bit, even though, you know, I've, like I say all the time, I've worked in tech for, for decades now. Um, I'm always, uh-huh. uh, <laughs> I tend to be the troubleshooter. So I, I sit and let some other people uh, dip their toes in first and then come in and uh, and try to smooth out the uh, the kinks and the bugs afterwards nice nice yeah i i don't know i i like um i guess i guess if i were an android guy i probably would hang back because android stuff android based stuff seems to come out with just a few more bugs because of the nature of the software you know what i mean it's i mean the software has to fit onto thousands of different platforms and depending on what you're testing it on you could have a wildly different experience but you know when i get brand new Apple stuff that comes out. I generally, you know, you, you, because of the media, you typically hear about all the negative stuff, you know, oh, somebody got the new XXX thing and it had these, all these problems, blah, blah, blah. And people just want to focus on that. But there were 10 million other people that got one and they had no problems with it. So, you know, I feel like if, if Apple's going to put something out, there's a, they've got a pretty good track record of it being a, a, a relatively solid device right out of the box that they've tested. Like if they're planning on having glasses, augmented reality glasses out by 2021, let's just push it out as far as the reports are saying, somebody's wearing those at Apple headquarters right now. Like, I guarantee you, somebody is wearing something on their face that's a clunky version of what's going to come out in three years. And it's got all this crap on it. They've probably got this headgear. There's a battery attached to their neck. I mean, who knows what the hell is going on? But they're working on it now, and they're going to reduce all these things down into a consumer product probably within the next couple of years, assuming that timeline, and then spend a year testing that. And I mean, they don't do anything, you know, cheaply. So when they do come out with it, I think I think I think archaeology will be able to adapt it really fast. I mean, really fast. So, well, archaeology yeah. fits in uh, in a lot of ways. Maybe not with the, the public part that you were discussing uh, sure. of presenting materials back out for the people, but uh, but um, certainly in terms of overlays of different kinds of uh, of information. You know, and we talk about with uh, augmented reality and glasses. You know, the the great examples that everybody calls upon are, are like an auto mechanic that needs shop right. manuals right there on their head while they're under the car, uh, a, a surgeon while they're working that, uh, mm-hmm. that needs to remember something, needs to check something, needs to see some vital signs without turning away from what they're doing. Um, that sort of thing. Archaeologists, maybe not quite as dire as a surgeon, but certainly <laughs> we could benefit from, you, you've mentioned in the past, for example, um, software, cell phone software that can help identify uh, points. Yeah. Right. Lithics. Um, You know, certainly something that could help you identify objects in the field would be a natural fit for uh, for the field archaeologist. Right. Yeah. Anything else that you could bring up data sets and uh, and overlay them while you continue your work uh, would be would be useful and easy. And I'm sure it's not just archaeology and auto mechanics and surgeons, but uh, but a lot of places, a lot of people that have to work with their hands and have to work with, you know, specialized information that uh, would really find it useful to have it right (laughs) literally in their face. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, the cool thing is right now, I mean, we can, if, if somebody wants to develop something uh, right now that can mimic what that would do, uh, most of the high-end phones these days, the iPhone 10, the uh, even the iPhone 8 
8 Plus, I think, um, will do it. But uh, definitely the iPhone 10 or the iPhone X, whatever you want to call it, and then the high-end Samsung models and all those, they all have really solid augmented reality capabilities. And you just need to develop an application for these devices that will do what you want it to do. And when the glasses comes along, it should be a relatively easy, from a development standpoint, a relatively easy switch to just put it into that framework. You know, I mean, you'll have to change some some aspect ratios and things like that and how it displays and and stuff like that. But the the equipment manufacturers are deciding how that information is going to, you know, paste itself on your retina. You just have to create the code. And you can do that now and make a great augmented reality application. Um, because, I, I mean, I keep thinking, man, if I had all the time and money in the world, I'd love to see an app right now because, you know, we're, we're doing... We're doing some things right now where, you know, you don't need to record everything with a submeter trimble. But even if you do need submeter, there's obviously ways to do that with a with a tablet. Um, you know, you just get the submeter antenna, things like that. But recording into, I mean, even using like, uh, you know, trimble software for iPad or something, you can record on a map into certain things, put all your data on these points and record these things on there. And what I'd love to see right now, I'd love to be able to, as a crew chief, just hold up my tablet with the camera on and pan around the site and have people who are recording things, have their data be, you know, sending to me via some sort of, you know, method. There's multiple ways we can do this, but sending me what they're doing in real time. So I don't have to call out or get on the radio in a windy environment, or for that matter, on a Navy base that I worked on where we we weren't even allowed to use radios because the frequencies weren't allowed. So, you know, you've got to shout across this site, you know, two, 300 meters away and say, what have you finished? What do you have left to do? Whereas I could just hold up my device, look around and see these little flags of completion or, you know, that they're actually working on it or something like that. Um, but worst case scenario, just show me, show me that you finished it. Like what, what's been done and what still needs to be done. You know what I mean? And, mm-hmm. and give me that from a, from just a visual standpoint, man, that would be invaluable and seems ridiculously easy to do right now. I don't know. Uh, the other applications are obviously excavation, things like that. Just being able to visualize what's been done, you know, what you're doing and, and uh, really kind of efficient project uh, and site management. I think, I think all that would be enhanced greatly by augmented reality. So who knows? No, I agree. It, well, it's coming down. Yeah. <laughs> Without a doubt. It is. It is. And like I said, with the ability for phones to do it now, you really just need to find an application that either exists now that we can put data into or somebody just needs to make one and uh, and, and we'll go from there. So who knows? I, I think having your I think if somebody wanted to if a developer wanted to make an application that was for the general public, because trying to make something for archaeologists is not going to be very profitable for them. But if they make something for the general public where you can basically uh, basically kind of like a create your own augmented reality application right now, we're just using other people's applications and things like that, but where you can enter in your own data and have it appear in different places, that's really all we're looking for to start. So if anybody listening to this, um, as we end segment one here, knows of any applications like that, where you can put your own data in there, and maybe the Maybe the simple solution is just a Google Earth map, and then you port that into like Layar or something like that. And I'm not even sure if that if that works, but it wouldn't be three dimensional data, but at least be two dimensional data. So if I hold my phone up, I'll be able to see where those points are on the ground. Hell, maybe we just solved it. Maybe it already exists. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Well, uh, you know, let's. Uh, wow, we're only doing two segments of this, and then our app of the day segment, and we've already you know one topic, and we've killed the entire. Uh, yeah, we kill the entire first segment. Well, so that means we've got a whole stock of different topics that we can drop in anytime <laughs> we need to. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's either that or the next segment's going to be the lightning round. So here we go. <laughs> All right. We'll be back in just a second. Uh, stay tuned for this um, advertisement from Simon Fraser University. Uh, I was told that the last year when last year when we put these ads up for them, we, we, we made new ones this year, but last year when we did this for them, after the first ad went up, I don't know if it was on this podcast or CRM Mark because it's playing on both, but within three days of the first episode going up, they had somebody apply for their graduate program. So that's pretty amazing. It's pretty awesome. Um, and it's a great program. I know one of the directors of the program. Um, so listen to this ad, check it out, and we'll be back in a second. 
Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, British Columbia has launched a professional online master's program built by and for cultural heritage management practitioners. The thesis-based MA or coursework-only graduate certificate both offer integrated study of HRM's ethical, legal, business, and research priorities. The MA thesis requirements comply with registered professional archaeologists and other jurisdictional standards. This is the perfect graduate program for bachelor-level CRM practitioners ready to make a career commitment but not ready to relocate or quit their job. We have advertised for SFU in the past and we had a long podcast about SFU's program and I highly recommend it. If you're looking to get a graduate degree in cultural resource management, this is the way to go. Apply today at www.sfu.ca forward slash archaeology. That's www.sfu.ca forward slash archaeology to take your career to new levels today. All right, welcome back to the Archaeotech Podcast, episode 81, and we are switching topics now. Um, you know, we'd written about a bunch of things uh, before we wanted to uh, record this episode. And uh, Paul, you wrote down a few things, and I'm very interested in, uh, you know, how this next topic can can help us in archaeology and beyond. Okay, the next topic that I put down here, the one that we discussed a little bit off, uh, off the air, uh, I put down APIs and data shuttles. And the reason why I put this down is because... I've been up to my ears in this for the last few weeks. And so I haven't had much time to actually think or do anything archaeologically related because at the end of the day, I'm just um, totally wrecked. I can't think clearly. Yeah. I haven't been able to you know, play guitar or anything. I can watch TV and oh that's God. about it. Um, uh, the project I've been working on is, uh, this is not archaeological, this is and my job here at the school, is we have a, a, a homegrown registration system for the high school students to register for the classes in the upcoming year. And we do a phase system that starts in January with pre-approvals and then uh, and goes through a couple different phases so that we can schedule the, uh, the, the core blocks early and then fill out students' schedules around that so that they can get the so we don't get conflicts in their schedules, don't con get conflicts in the teachers' schedules, don't get conflicts in the rooms, and so that the students can get their the most number of their preferred courses that uh, mm -hmm. that they can. Um, lots of constraints, very complicated process. And what made it even more complicated than normal is that we switched our whole uh, student management system over the last year. So we used to yeah. have one that had an Oracle database as the back end and all the queries that came in and out for the schedule and the enrollments and all that came from this one database. We switched to uh, a different provider, Blackbod, um, and they have ways that we can get the data in and out and they have ways that you can can queries but I can't query their database with SQL directly anymore. So mm -hmm. we have to have canned queries that then our web app queries and imports into a local database on our end. And then oh, we geez. have other uh, other data that comes out as a CSV form from, um, from scheduling software that has to get merged in so that we know exactly what the schedule is. Because we don't actually, even though the schedule is in there in the, uh, in the current student management software in Blackpod, we don't have a way of extracting it from there to use. So we have <laughs> data coming in from, from a few different directions and they all have to get massaged and put together in a way that, uh, that will yield useful data to go back into the student, student management system. And so right. APIs, uh, they stand for application, application programming interfaces. And, um, Really, they're published endpoints that can be used by a programmer to get data into or out of a system. Uh, so they're often used in different uh, web deliverables. Um, I took a one-day little seminar a couple months ago uh, here from the New York City Digital Humanities Society, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. uh, and they offered a, a series of different uh, workshops, and one of them was on APIs. And they used an example from New York Times, and so you sign up so that you can get your um, so you can get the rights to query their API, and then you can using their published endpoints uh, get data back out of it. And so I hmm. knew that there was a, a news story from my great from my grandfather from the from like 1960. Um, so I went looking for that, and uh, you know, a little poking and prodding, I found it. Now, API is just as kind of a general 
sort of term, but most APIs now, especially for things that are delivered over the web, are de- delivered uh, HTTP, HTTPS, and they're done with uh, a system called REST. And you're used to seeing this in well-structured URLs, you know, so you might have something that URL, you know, www.arcpodnet.com slash users slash maybe a user ID. And you can right. query that to get information about the user. Um, there's no hard, fast set way of how these are built and what the, what the, uh, the return data looks like, but there's kind of a, a gelling on this kind of interface being delivered with uh, HTTP or HTTPS and, uh, and where you can drill in as you expand that URL sequence out farther and farther. You can drill into different kinds of data uh, to more and more specific ones, or you can use it to modify or to, uh, to insert new data records, depending on what's been exposed by the programmers that control it. Um, so, like I said, we have we have a lot of data queries that we built that live in this new system. And fortunately for us, they allow API access to it. So I can say, you know, go to the Dalton.org site and, you know, with appropriate user login key, I can provide that key and then I can build out the rest of the query. I can say, you know, give me the list and I'll get the list ID. And that returns, for example, all the high school students who are enrolled in courses next year, which is extremely useful to me. Um, Nice. I would like to talk to uh, Eric Hansa because I think that they have exposed some APIs for, for querying their data. I'm sure they have, yeah. Context, uh, and he's very, very on top of this and could talk about it much more clearly and intelligently <laughs> than I could. Uh, but uh, but the general, this exposing of different data sets is something that a lot of different companies have been uh, have been embracing, frankly, uh, to make their data more useful. Here in, in New York City, the MTA has been exposing their uh, their subway and bus schedules and locations you know so you can download an app for your phone or your uh, or your tablet that'll tell you how long you know, the wait is going to be until your next bus uh, that's really useful and they they've exposed these things you know n- i don't know about the mta in particular if they've exposed it publicly or mm-hmm. they've only exposed it to people who have gotten permission but then those people have permission then to republish those data through their apps to you um yeah. And typically, again, it's going to be exposed in this kind of restful interface, this URL that that drills into the particular bit of information that you need. So, yeah. So the cool thing about APIs is, uh, you know, if there's a if there's an application that you're using out there uh, and you're thinking, man, this would be really good for this kind of thing, or I could use the data that they have here and you know, display it in this other way that might be beneficial to some people. And as long as there's no you know, challenges with, with using somebody else's data and like with transit schedules and stuff like that, they want people to use the bus. So they're going to say, yeah, sure, go ahead, y- use this API. And, and, uh, you know, maybe the, uh, maybe something like the transit authority, they get a certain amount of money to build the infrastructure that tracks all their buses. You know, they've got GPSs on them. They've got this tracking software, they've got all these things, but then they're pretty much out and they're not really in the app making business anyway. So they make an API that allows you to access their data and somebody else comes along with a whiz bang, graphically rich application like Uber or something like that. So you can actually see where the buses are. Um, mm-hmm. And that's been around for a while. Man, I remember seeing that. Uh, the transit system in Georgia, at the University of Georgia, well, it, in Athens, Georgia, had that. And that was really handy. And it was really, really accurate. I took the bus a lot when I was on that campus because parking passes were like $800 for a semester. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, forget that. I'm either riding my bike or I'm taking the bus. And um, so I rode the bus and man, you could see a bus turn the corner, you know, several blocks down and come and I'm looking on the app and I see the bus turn the corner. It was maybe a, a couple seconds behind. Um, there was a little bit of delay and I don't know if that was built in for security or if that was just a, a function of the, of the program. But you know, it was, uh, it was really, really close and, uh, it was, it was kind of neat. So thinking about that for archeology, span like I said, if you're using an application on your phone right now or on your computer or wherever, and you're thinking, man, I bet I could use this, you know, contact them and see if they have, uh, an API because the developer has to build that API in. So it right. interfaces with the data points, like you said, that they want. And, you know, maybe something could be constructed, um, like you're doing to, 
do something else with the data or add more data to the system as well. You know, it goes both ways. Yeah, so augment it or add you know, directly manipulate it depending on what's appropriate right. in the conditions. But, uh, but exactly with the MTA, started trying to make some of their own stuff and then they realized that it was much more sensible for them to, to actually just provide access to the data through published right. safe and secure means um, and then let other people go through all the trouble of making a fancy nice beautiful app right and maintain it as software upgrades go on and blah 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 uh, so this is a way that a lot of uh, a lot of companies that pr that have data are yeah. opening up companies and Government institutions, government and other institutions, um, are allowing themselves to open up access to some of their innards, the bits mm -hmm. that people want to see. And so, certainly in archaeology, I think that it would be very useful for the public archaeology side of it, being able to open it up, and you could expose then quite a bit of information about, say, sites without revealing the exact geographical location of the site, right? Right. which might be something that you don't want to expose. Um, so rather than give somebody the keys to your kingdom and let them write in on your database, you provide an API that allows for selected views that other people can find useful and can slice and dice and augment in ways that they want to, uh, and depending on the terms of use, even republish, depending on, uh, on again, what's appropriate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because depending on, you know, if you created your database uh, in a robust and versatile enough way then yeah exactly like you said the api i mean literally just gives you access to these data points you know you can't break out of those channels and go get something else you'd need you'd need a different api or different level of access or something like that depending on how complicated it is so yeah it's perfect i i would love it and we really should get eric on here um and talk about what open context um, is doing these days. Cause I, I had that short interview with him on the architect mm -hmm. podcast. Um, I can't remember if we're not on the last one or the one before that, but uh, anyway, check that out. And, you know, cause they're always at the conferences these days and, yeah. and it's, it's great to find out what they're doing. And I'm trying to get, as, as I get wild note off the ground for archeology, span I've already talked to Eric about uh, probably going to be some kind of API thing, but integrating wild note with open context and having you know eventually we didn't get this far in our discussions just like at the conference in at the saas but what i would like to see is having just a button that says you know we have exports at wild note we don't have exports from the mobile device yet but in the web interface you have different exports so you can go to an excel pivot table you can go to a pdf that looks like your site form you can have any number of exports and we can craft those custom exports well it'd be great to see an export that just says export to open context and it just sends it to them and it sends it to them using probably an API that takes our data points and marries it up with their data points and just fills their database with data and they don't have to do any massaging because right now they get a bunch of stuff in from the states like when they're working on the Dina project and they've really got to do a lot of work to the data <laughs> so you know to get it to mesh with the database that they've got because the data wasn't collected with that database in mind so if we just create that connection um man that would be that would be amazing i love it how so how's an api different or similar to a data shuttle because you mentioned data shuttles but you haven't really talked about those yeah okay i mentioned data shuttles because i mentioned them side by side because that's i don't even know how common of a term that is but that's certainly one that that's used uh fairly frequently in the um, in the ad tech sector mm -hmm. here because a lot of people are having the same issue they have multiple databases sometimes they have legacy databases of student information they've got scheduling information that comes from scheduling software they've you know which is exactly the problem that i'm fighting right now uh they've got uh contact databases billing databases all these things and when something changes one place you want to update uh, the analogous data in other places right. uh, so you know the 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 most common way to do this is have people <laughs> monitor the changes in one place and then you know manually change them sure. to match in another place but that's that's problematic um it you know if somebody is sick for a few days you know the, the data gets logged uh, it gets uh, backlogged and it's not current everywhere or you know if you're if you have people manually doing things it gets uh, it's prone to, to human mm -hmm. error right and so the data shuttle is really any kind of automated script or system that takes and either directly queries or accesses via an API one set of data and massages it for inserting into a different data set into a different mm -hmm. database uh, 
And that's kind of what you're talking about, um, you know, in the wish list here of, uh, of wild note to uh, open context. It would be taking data in one form, how it's been collected in, in, uh, on the tablets in wild note and recomposing it in such a way that it can be sent via published APIs into open context right. databases, which can then get re-exposed <laughs> from them via another set of APIs yeah. so that someone else could uh, could come by and, and look at the data and, and use it in however way is appropriate for them. So, you know, data shuttles, uh, there's no one sort of thing. Again, I said APIs have tended to, you know, to gel around being uh, internet deliverable, HTTP, HTTPS, uh, RESTful URLs uh, that let you drill mm -hmm. in uh, to, to particular data sets, uh, to, to particular data points in your data set. Um, the, the data that gets sent back and forth across the internet tends to be encoded as, uh, as JSON, right. JavaScript object notation, which I've mentioned before is a data file format. Um, and so that, that's basically how everything's done. And there are other different, there are other technologies. Uh, one that was pretty popular for a number of years uh, that you may have heard of is SOAP, um, but that's a much more complex XML uh, based one. But the data shuttle then is not a particular technology. It's just whatever glue you uh, use that takes the data that you've extracted from one system, recomposes it so that then you can insert it into another system. And, you know, there are a lot of different ways you can do it. If anybody's interested in such things, um, you know, I would strongly look at using Python as a, as, as a programming language because I find that it's really easy for me to build these little uh, data shuttles that go between one system and another. Um, it's not the only one I can use. I've used PHP. I've used shell scripts. Right. <laughs> We've done all sorts of different things. But it's it's for, for me right now, bang for the buck, the quickest way I can get things from me. To so it, it sounds like with with that kind of data shuttle. So you're taking data from, like you said, one system or language or whatever, in converting it into another. Right. So it's it seems like. Right. I wonder if people who are running digital repositories and digital archives at museums and other institutions and things like that, if they have, I mean, if, if I were running it, I, this is what I would want to have. Um, but if they were running it, they, they would require data to come in in a certain way. Like even the BLM here in Nevada requires data in a certain way. You know, generally that way is a, a you know, Word doc <laughs> or a PDF, but that's still data and it's still in a certain way. So it, let's say it's just a Word document. Let's say that's your only thing. So I would want to have as part of my data preservation plan, a, uh, a half of a data shuttle that basically has the Word document half of that. And then when something comes down the line that we want to, you know, start converting that stuff to, because maybe Microsoft Word is now unsupported or something like that and they've gone on to something else and they've they've made a massive shift and and they're just not backwards compatible a certain number of generations which is which is kind of true now I'm not sure you can open like first generation word documents anymore um, maybe you can but uh, yeah not easily so so you create that first half of the data shuttle and you you have an eye on the cycle and you have somebody managing that and then when a new format comes around you build the second half of the data shuttle and then you convert everything over and then you now that second half becomes the first half of the new data shuttle and you know you go from there you you be proactive with it I don't even know if that makes sense from a development and coding standpoint. Yeah, it does. I mean, if you if you um, if you control both ends of the process, yeah. you you define file exporters and file importers and some kind of file transfer protocol that you can then you know have as your standard. So that way, you you know you always export to that intermediary protocol, and you can always import from it. Um, it takes a lot of forethought. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever done anything like that. I've thought about doing things like that with archaeological data for a long, mm -hmm. long time. And it's always been too hairy of a, of a, uh, an issue for me to tackle by myself. Um, but I'm sure, I'm sure that some of our listeners have also tackled the same sort of, uh, the same sort of problems and have probably made some good headway, at least in their own projects, or maybe even at trying to develop some sort of more universal, uh, data importer, expert, or intermediary. Yeah. Man, format. you know, I was just thinking another thing, and then we're we're pretty much done with the segment. Uh, I, I know we just went the whole time. Anyway, another thing that I think would be really fun uh, idea for digital data repositories or anybody that stores digital data to do uh, and stores it long term is to every. 
four or five years, maybe, depending on, you know, what kind of data you're dealing with, buy a cheap laptop, okay? Turn on that laptop, make sure the operating system is at total, totally current, you know, put it online, make sure it's current, it's get all those licenses, it's going to work. Update the software you need to read the data that you need, and then shut that laptop off and just throw it on a shelf. Just throw it on a shelf. That way, in 10, 15 years, power sources are easy to come by, but the operating systems are not. So... In 15 yeah. years, you could simply just put, hook up a power source to that laptop, probably plug it into the wall. I don't think that's going to change much anytime soon. Fire that thing up, and you can read all the data in your repository. Um, you just pop it into the laptop, and you're done. I don't see why that wouldn't work, honestly. I mean, the um, the hard drives and things like that, if they're not if they're not being challenged, you know, physically or anything like that, and they're just sitting on a shelf. I mean, honestly, that thing should fire up just about any time in the future there will be some degradation probably in the in the in the in the data but if you had like a solid state drive maybe not you know um i I don't know it's it's an interesting thought they always have old computers lying around but the problem is the old computers don't work anymore um but if you just set one up for today's current standards and then throw it on a shelf in 15 years it should still work to today's current standards which is where your old data is anyway well that's actually a strong uh, a strong argument in favor of virtualization Um, which is something that we've done. We have old servers uh, running like Windows 2000 that um, we Mm -hmm. don't use anymore. Uh, But we're, you know, we're hesitant to throw away entirely. Certainly the boxes are long, long gone. But before the boxes left, we uh, we virtualize them. So they uh, they live as files on on our virtual world. If we ever need to spin one up for some reason to look at some, you know, 10, 15 year old data, we can because it's right there. But it's not taking up any space. It's uh, it's running a very antiquated version of Windows now. But um, but it's fine because it's uh, it's basically frozen in amber from. 10, 15 years ago. I think that's going to be a business later on when time travel's invented is going to be going back to certain decades and just buying old computers <laughs> that can run old data. <laughs> that's, 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 like we can travel through time, but we can't open this goddamn Word document. <laughs> We're going to go back and buy an old compact, you know, Radio Shack Tandy computer and open this Word 3.1 file. <laughs> Oh my god! All right, well, uh, so much for our, our our grab bag episode covering multiple topics. We talked about basically two things, um, but that's great because tech is challenging and there's a lot to talk about. So, uh, I, I would say if you have anything else that you you know, we we constantly put these things out, but I think people listen to our podcast when they're also in challenging situations and and can't reply to us. I wish there was an easy way to do that within applications, but there isn't. But hey, if you're listening to this right now, you can probably look at your smartphone or wherever you listen to this and see the show notes and then click on our email addresses or Twitter handles and it should open up some application that will allow you to interact with us. So send us a quick note. Let us know what you think. Um, ask us any questions. We'll, we'll read your email on the air if you want us to. And, uh, and, and we'll go from there and, and you know, send us your send us your tech questions. What are you thinking about? What are you working on these days? And, uh, and we'll go from there. Yeah, it's always fun to get feedback, corrections, sure. questions, all of the above. Um, a lot to work on. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of experts out there that I love to hear from because people have different sets of experiences, different aptitudes, uh, different interests that uh, that that complement, uh, challenge, right. whatever, uh, what we've been doing, what we know. And, uh, and it's good to hear from everybody. Or if I've misrepresented something that you said, <laughs> <laughs> which is entirely nice. likely, um, please, I'd love to hear. I'd love to be corrected. Um, yeah, ab- absolutely. We're very much not the experts, but we like to talk about this stuff. So yeah, definitely send us corrections and, and, and your thoughts on these. So All right. Well, that's it for the main part of the show. We will be back in a minute with the app of the day segment. Back in a second. Hey, podcast fans and digital archaeologists. Have you heard about WildNote? It's a data collection app that works online or offline on your smartphone or tablet, iOS or Android. It allows you to collect field data easily, manage data efficiently, and generate data reports and site records effortlessly. We have a growing list of state site forms built in for your use and some generic forms that will work anywhere. Check out the shovel testing and photograph forms. You can get a free all-access 30-day trial today by going to wildnoteapp.com. That's wildnoteapp.com for your free 30-day trial. Now back to the show. (laughs) 
All right, welcome back to episode 81, and this is the app of the day segment that we're going to round out this episode with, and uh, I guess I'll start since uh, we didn't talk about it beforehand. <laughs> so um, I've got one, uh, you know, I've been, I, I wake up in the morning and I look at uh, Apple News and it kind of curates all your news for you based on some choices that you made, and I've got some some app stuff in there, and one of the uh, one of the things I see almost every day is this apps gone free thing, and uh, so apps, you know, app designers will... Um, or app developers will reduce or, or reduce to free their app for short periods of time just to promote it. And one of the apps that I found through that, because I don't think I would have purchased it otherwise, is called Motivate Me. And this is actually really hard to find because I found out that the guy is probably um, – probably playing off the success of a couple of other apps that have a very similar name. Uh, that being said, this is put together pretty well. And all it is is it's got this interface that has like your today thing, like your activities, you know, some inspirational quotes and productivity and some tips and you can put your mood in there. Um, it's really to kind of track to track you and how you're doing. Um, you know, uh, some people like this kind of thing and other people think it's a bunch of, uh, it's a bunch of craziness. But if you go to your diary, you can set up goals. And I do like the way the goals are interfaced. They can, you know, you can, you set up these goals and you give them a certain priority level. So when you give them a priority level, it changes the color and changes the size of a circle. So you can look at your goals in more of a graphical feature. You can zoom in and out and you can see what goals are more important to you and which goals are less important. And you, you can click on them, see when the goal was created, see what activities you've done that are in support of that goal. Because when you do an activity like, you know, whether it's a workout or, um, you know, writing a report or doing something, you can say, you know, that that activity is in support of that goal and you can see how your your progress is towards that and your goals can be anything i mean they can be anything from you know losing weight to having a certain uh financial status or you know buying a car i mean i don't know what it ever is and and uh and you can do anything you want in here so it's it's relatively versatile that being said it's so versatile that it's a little bit confusing. Like it's really, it's actually really confusing on how to use this thing and how to set it up. Um, and I don't know if I'm going to use it, uh, all the time or not. I've been using it just for a few weeks just to kind of try it out. But, uh, I don't know. It's the kind of thing you have to put a lot of effort and time into, um, just like writing in a journal or something like that. The minute you stop doing it, you just like never write in it again. <laughs> so, um, so I don't know. It's it's kind of neat, and I, I thought this would be good for CRM archaeologists because, you know, we live such, I guess, nomadic lifestyles in most cases that it's kind of hard to focus on living your life and doing the things that you want to do. And, you know, as you travel around, you feel like you're constantly almost in a field school every time or you're constantly on vacation almost, and you're constantly in different places. And just having a, a hard focus on the goals that you're working towards, you know, no matter what those are, educational, financial, career, whatever the case may be, you know, having something to go back to that kind of sends you a little nudge every day that says, hey, you're working on this goal. Let's do something in support of that today. So I don't know. Might work for some people, might not for others. Um, this is an iOS application. The link to it is in the show notes. Um, it was free when I got it, but I think it's like 99 cents otherwise. And uh, give it a try. And if you don't like this, try something else because there's literally thousands of apps like this out there for like goal tracking and motivation and things like that. And even if you think that it wouldn't work for you, if you've never tried it before, it just might work for you. So give it a shot if you've got some things you want to accomplish, which we all do. So short and sweet, that's pretty much it um, for that application. What do you got, Paul? Well, I've got actually a couple follow-up questions for you about that. Um, sure. You know, so a few years ago, there were all sorts of different uh, different methodologies that were popping out for how to how to organize our kind of increasingly fractured and crazy lives where everybody felt overstressed and too busy with everything. There are things like getting things done, GTD, and uh, mm -hmm. Merlin Mann made a little cottage industry out of these things and life hacker was uh, was a pretty big website at the time um, if this particular app just went free do you have any sense if it's still under active development or uh, is it something from you know a couple years ago uh, maybe at the tail end of that that last wave of uh, you know efficiency experts and efficiency uh, methodologies um, that has kind of mm -hmm. just been sunsetted well, uh, and that's a good question, and that's a that's the kind of thing you've got to you've got to ask yourself when you look at apps. But this was 
This has been continuously updated in 2018 when you look at the development history. Okay. You look at January, March, April, May, three times in May as they're getting ready for uh, uh, probably for iOS uh, 12 coming out here in a few months. Mm-hmm. And iOS 11.4 just came out so in beta, so that's you know preparing for that. So that being, that's all I can tell you. And I can also say, too, that it's now two ninety nine. I think it was free for a day. Ah. Um, so okay. now it's two dollars and ninety nine cents, and it's called motivate me as one word dash your motivation because there's probably five or six apps when you type motivate me, they all come up and they all have the same name. They're just mm-hmm. slightly different. So um, I don't know. Th- again, this one seems this one seems pretty good. Um, seems like the guy has put some serious development, in, and I say guy because the developer is listed as like a single person, not a company. So, um, but it's got relatively decent ratings 4.1 out of 5 stars with only 7 ratings so that's not a very good uh, ratio there but um, and let's see I think it came out in 2016 and I think he's Italian so who knows um, I don't know it, it seems like it's being supported right now is all the best I can say for that well that's good because it'd be a shame to you know to invest the time and the effort to uh, to, to jump in on something like that and have it pulled out from under you <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Yeah. Uh, have you, you know, this might be the topic for another uh, entire episode, but have you ever used any of these various systems um, for, you know, like the like GTD, like getting things done? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I use different things all the time, honestly. it's uh, It depends on what I'm doing and what I need to get done. Uh, honestly, uh, one of the things one of the things that I keep going back to is Trello and, Mm -hmm. and just using Trello to, you know, not just to do lists, but like to do lists on steroids and, and really managing, I mean, entire projects, but also just like daily tasks. And, uh, you know, one of the things, even if you don't want to do any of this, you don't want to get into another application, you know, one of the things that really helps me get focused on a really busy day. And I've got this right now today on my phone. Um, I will put all of my tasks, whether it's just on a, a note, like on, on Apple, you, on iPhone, you've just got the notes app and Google has the same thing or Android. Just write down your tasks in a note and then I screenshot it because they're formatted to fit your screen. So then I screenshot it. And if it's something, if it's a really important day and I've got to get a lot of stuff done and I really need to stick to my schedule, I make that my um, lock screen background. So every time I lift up my phone, and we all lift up our phones probably 100 times a day, every time I lift up my phone and my screen brightens, I see my to-do list. <laughs> so, you know, that really helps. Um, mm-hmm. it, it really just like, because you can make all the to-do lists you want, and you can do all the goal setting you want, but if you never go back and look at that, it's completely pointless. So, um, and that's one of the things that Motivate Me does, is if you have an Apple Watch, or even if you don't, it'll put the notification on your phone, so when you pull it up you'll you'll see that but it'll send you notifications on a schedule that you determine like if you want to know at seven o'clock every morning what your focus is for the day it'll it'll tell you and do that send you some kind of inspirational quote or something at the same time or you could turn that stuff off so whatever you want to do but um but yeah, and it integrates well with the rest of your activities. Like I went for a, a lap swim this morning at uh, 6 a.m., and that's on here in my activities. And it just linked right in, and I didn't have to add that myself. So oh, Awesome. Um, and uh, and it knew that that type of activity is associated with uh, one of my goals. So, you know, there you go. And it, 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 it did it automatically. So that's what I like is when apps do stuff automatically. Because the more work we have to put in these things, the less likely we are to use them, honestly. So if you can set a few things and have some stuff happen just like on its own, then you're more likely to stick with it. So Yeah, yeah. that's what I've talked about before with some of the apps. Like when I was talking about Fuelly for uh, tracking right. gas, uh, Phillips my cars uh you know the easier it is the less friction there is the more likely you are to use it and mm-hmm. just enough friction and then you just give it up really quickly so it'll be interesting to see if you uh if this one has too much friction for you or if those uh those links between apps and uh if that that actually makes it useful to you and makes it easy enough mm-hmm. yeah indeed all right so um mine is uh, maybe less useful <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's another app that I found that I've, I kind of like. Um, actually, the app itself, I don't pay a whole lot of attention to. It's kind of the service behind the app. Uh, and what I'm talking about, it's called Bands in Town. It's, there's a website associated with it. Um, I don't ever use the website. Um, I've used the app for a couple years now. And basically what you do, you, uh, you have to sign in. Uh, I, there's no, it's a free app. There's no charge to use it as an end user i assume that bands and venues have to pay to get their things listed their their shows listed but um 
you uh, you set up your account on the app and give it permission to scan your music and what it does then is it looks at your location you can set a radius so uh, you know here in new york i've got a 13 mile radius i'm not sure exactly why i set it at that but it seemed comfortable um (laughs) if i go too much farther than that i'm out into parts of new jersey that i'm really just not going to get to um and it shows me different shows different uh different concerts that are happening based off of what my music preferences are and i can um you know, it'll show me things from bands that I have in my music list, in my playlist, and uh, will also show me things that are related to bands, you know, so mm-hmm. similar music styles, musicians that have played in one band and another band, that sort of thing. Um, so I don't actually go to a whole lot of concerts. I go to a handful of them every year, but I like this. Um, the reason why I don't use the app itself is that because I have this account now, uh, and it's recorded my preferences. I get emails pretty much daily every time one of the bands that I follow um, has a new show. And so I use this. I bounce between, uh, I've probably mentioned before, I bounce between Manhattan and uh, Brewster, New York, which is an hour north of the city. Mm-hmm. And so I can move my location in the app to either of those. And like I said, open up the uh, the radius smaller than or bigger than uh, the 13 miles it's currently set to. And it gets all sorts of different things. It gets uh, big name acts, you know, so like U2 comes through and it'll tell me that U2's, you know, showing three days at, uh, at uh, MetLife Stadium. <laughs> uh, but it'll also show me things like little kind of obscure local bands um that that i enjoy um so it's, it's kind of a fun way to keep track of different different shows i mean in new york we have tons of venues obviously but we also have tons of different ways of finding out what ha- what's happening on any given weekend or weekday you know different magazines in the newspaper different websites and such uh probably more so than in most other places uh, though i suppose most urban areas are going to be somewhat similar uh but then you end up having to look at you know a dozen different websites to find both the big acts and the small apps and uh small acts excuse me and uh and for some reason this this bands in town thing just seems to cut right through that and i have one place to look to see uh to see where different shows are so hmm. the app itself very simple like i said you, you log in you create an account you um you give it permission to scan your your uh music on your on your phone and it comes back with a list then of all of the bands that it recognized and it shows me who's playing currently someplace nearby i can sort it by artists i can sort it by events um the events will be well so for example uh i'm just looking here right now i see that uh on friday there's damian marley playing at the governor's ball music festival great i don't have any damien marley but it tells me it's based off of peter tosh and i do have some peter tosh in my music uh in in my uh on the music in my phone so yeah. you know the ya ya ya's i don't have any of that but it says it's based off of pixies okay sure why not um mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so it's it's a nice way of also kind of discovering uh, some acts that are playing locally. So there's every now and then I'll go to something that just sounds interesting because they, they tied it for whatever reason to a band that, that I do like, uh, you know, I'll listen to a YouTube video and I go, Oh, well, that's nice. And I, and I get out to go see the show. Um, in that way, it's kind of like the old Napster, you know, when you just log on to some random person across the internet onto their <laughs> music playlist and because there was one song you wanted to hear and you'd scan through their their music collection they had you know they'd have some really interesting things and so yeah. kind of cross cut and poke through it again i'm not sure how the the bands get their listings on here and i was going to say you know up in brewster i live a few miles from uh it's called daryl's house club it's uh it's daryl hall's club hmm. <laughs> Uh, just down the road from me about 10 15 minutes and that didn't used to be on here so i thought well that was a big hole and i was going to complain about it but um i just changed my location on here to brewster and all the shows that are happening at daryl's house are now popping up there so i guess they're expanding that either that or i was searching wrong somehow but i'm not sure how one would search wrong because there's it's it's a minimal (laughs) app i mean you can search by uh popular and just announced there's also a, a um a social component of it where you can say you know i i want to go to this one or i bought tickets i think 
part of their monetization of it is that you can click through to buy tickets. And so I suppose that there's a kickback to them uh, if you buy tickets based sure. off of clicking through from the app. But um, I have no particular use. I always say this for any of the uh, the social aspects of this. I don't care who knows that I'm going to go see the <laughs> Nat Osborne band, you know, another local band here. Um, but, uh, you know, and anybody that I do care, I see face to face or I'll call or I'll send an email and say, hey, you know, <laughs> do you really want to go to this with me? Mm-hmm. Um, and then they say no. And then I go by myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, uh. but, you know, if one is into that sort of thing, uh, it, it tries to tie in the social aspects, too. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's interesting. There's a whole friends aspect. Yeah. Um, I guess so. Like back to that Napster analogy, say there's somebody here who has very similar taste in music. Um, you maybe friend them through the app and follow what they're following and expand your own repertoire of live music. But um, but again, that's not something I'm doing with it. Mm-hmm. Well, that sounds pretty cool. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, to tie that back to. Uh, archaeologists i mean we're always in in different towns and things like that and be able to change your location and you know you just want to forget about the day for a little while and go see a concert it would be nice to you know just pop that open and go see because i mean most of the time you get to a new city it's like jesus where do i find a listing of everything that's happening in this town probably nowhere and then you don't even know the venues if it's a new place for you so uh being able to have this curated by somebody else is a is a pretty cool deal yeah, so. nice. I like the way you tied that back to being useful for archaeologists because I was really <laughs> drawing a blank on how I was going to do it. But you're absolutely right. I mean, it, that that's exactly the reason why I use it even here in yeah. New York because I don't want to have to look at 20, 30 different places, you know, sure. different websites and newspapers and things to figure things out. And, um, you know, I'm sure it's missing stuff, but I'm pretty impressed with the range of things it does catch. Mm-hmm. That's cool. I might have to check that out because there's a couple places right downtown Reno here that, yeah, I mean, you have to go right to their website because we, we're surrounded by casinos and other hotels. and But typically, you have to go to their website to find out what's going on. And there's a place right, right. across the street from us that we can see from our balcony. When there's a big name there, there's like six of those huge um, traveling buses, you know, that are parked in the alley right behind the place. And we're like, my God, who's here now? Somebody huge. And it's like a pulling teeth just to figure out who it is. Um so yeah, having something like I might have to download it just so I can stock them from my balcony and find out you know who's who's down there, who's doing what, um, <laughs> <laughs> what's everybody here to see. So, all right, well, cool. Um, I, I like having apps on here that uh, that increase convenience for people because we live such hard lives sometimes. Anything you can do to make your leisure life more simple, um, or at least uh, you know help you help you wind down or, or do whatever. Those are great apps. So if you guys have any suggestions for apps that you use that, that help you do these sorts of things um, or that you use for work or, or whatever you want to do, then let us know. Um, our contact info is in the in the show notes at arcpodnet.com forward slash archaeotech and then for this episode forward slash 81. So check that out. Thanks a lot, Paul, for joining me today. Thanks, Chris. Good talking to you. And we'll see you guys next time. Thanks for listening to the Architect Podcast. Links to items mentioned on the show are in the show notes at www.archpodnet.com slash Archaeotech. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com and paul at lugal.com. Support the show by becoming a member at archpodnet.com slash members. The music is a song called Off Road and is licensed free from Apple. Thanks for listening. This show is produced and recorded by the Archaeology Podcast Network, Chris Webster and Tristan Boyle in Reno, Nevada at the Reno Collective. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.